So we're going to start the conversation today by looking at the work of Joe Fox. And Will Tom is going to get curious. So I'm going to go ahead and share Joe's work. Just a moment. And here we go. Go ahead, Joe. Okay. Um, hello, everybody. Um, I'm Joe Fox, I'm Gallery Route One Artist Member. Um, believe this is my fourth year as an artist member, and um, but I've been involved in uh, with the gallery for a number of years, and I currently live and work in Point Ray Station. Um, and uh, yeah, so I just wanted to start the conversation with this first image. Uh, this is actually from the gallery uh, in the project space. And I believe um, uh, this may have been the first occasion that Will had seen my work. Uh, this was a group show um, of some other local artists. Um, let's see, I'm trying to think of some of the people that were there. There was um, Ito, uh, Yoshimoto, um, uh, Sarah Myers, um, a fellow named Eric and uh, Celine Underwood was there. And we just kind of put this show together uh, with the help of Madeline. And this was back in 2011, I think. So this may have been the first occasion that Will had seen my work. And I had a few pieces in this show, uh, which are all more or less in the frame there um, and kind of shows a, you know, a variety of the different ways that I approach making sculpture. Um, and at that time I was, I was doing slightly larger more installation based work. Um, and lately I've been scaling things back a bit, but uh, on the right, there's a piece that's this kind of dark circular lines. And then in the back, there's a piece that's hanging from the ceiling that's got a white kind of shapes. And then in the foreground, there's another piece on the pedestal that is made of, um, a variety of materials uh, put together. It's sitting on a mirror, so it's got this reflective surface. And, but I just wanted to include this shot because it shows the three pieces. It kind of, you know, gets the conversation going. So. <laughs> <laughs> so this was this one in the show. Uh, yeah, this came yeah. actually uh, a little bit before that show. Um, you know, most of my work has only been shown in Gallery Route 1 over the last number of years. Um, mm. And I've lived in West Marin since 2000. Um, got involved with the gallery around 2009. And um, this was during the first geography of, around the time of the first Geography of Hope conference. And um, the gallery was seeking proposals for artists to do installations in the space in conjunction with that conference. And so I submitted a proposal, um, which I think was a little bit ambitious. It, it was kind of a large scale installation and um, I wasn't able to do it at that time, but the gallery came back to me and asked if I was interested in showing my work in the project space. So I had some sculptures back there. This is one of those pieces. Um, is this is called End of Autumn. And that was, uh, <laughs> copper pipe with leaves uh, covered in beeswax. So it, um, you know, it's kind of like a tree branch, but I gathered the leaves and then dried the leaves in a book, you know, pressed them flat and then coated them with beeswax and then put it all together. So it, it looked, you know, kind of like a tree branch, but there's elements in the pipes of, you know, it's all found um, copper pipe from plumbing, uh, you know, like during the course of like doing like a demo in a house during a construction mm -hmm. job, I just ended up with these little scrap pieces of pipe. And so there's some little fittings and things that are still soldered on there. And uh -huh. um, I just kind of soldered it all together like a plumber would. Yeah, half inch copper pipe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know it well. Um, Joe, I saw your, I think this is the first time I saw your work. And it okay. was- uh, it looked like it was all young West Marin artists. Is that right? That, yeah, yeah. So. Um, and I remember seeing it and thinking, 
I hope we can get this guy in the gallery. I hope he's more, I didn't think it was going to be a problem getting if you wanted to come in, but I didn't know if you were too busy. But because um, I know you're working full time, you have a family and um, but eventually you did join and I'm really happy of that. <laughs> so um, I would like to know actually see a few more of the slides and I want to ask you some questions about how you actually do this. It looks like this is a tin can filled with plaster and hanging from the wall with them. Yeah. Um, I love it, Joe. This is the, <laughs> the kind of thing that just makes me um, uh, happy to look at. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's just really uh, whimsical. So it's, a, and I love all your work. It's really, um, I'd like to see more of it. And I'm wondering, uh, well, I'd like, let's look at everything first and then I have some other questions. Okay. Yeah, this one is terrific. So it looks like a, it's a file, an old metal file drawer, it looks like. Yeah, yeah. And it's a little tiny bed. Yeah. <laughs> With an L yeah. bracket, an old shelf bracket that holds it up. Yeah. I filled a little plastic baggie with um, plaster to make the pillow. So it has those wrinkles and stuff in it. And um, mm -hmm. yeah, I'd gotten into this uh, time in my work when I was trying to make some things that were a little bit smaller and more manageable. And, and, I, and I just, you know, always seem to have objects and things sitting around my studio that are coming and going, you know, things in my life that are just passing through and they always end up in the studio. If it's something from the house that needs to go to the dump, it goes to my studio first uh -huh. and then hangs out there for a while. And, you know, sometimes they just become discards, but other times, and sometimes it takes many years. You know, I had that drawer box probably for five years or something before I ever did anything with it. But yeah. I, like, like with the tin can, I was, I started filling up the objects with plaster and letting the metal just rust on the inside and it kind of bleed into the plaster a little bit. Yeah. And this piece is called, let me see, Healing Hurt, right? This piece. Yeah, yeah. So. Can you yeah, talk are, about um, that a little bit? Yeah. Um, this is it's kind of hard to tell, you know, what the scale of this is, but it's actually quite small. Um, each of those uh, rectangular shapes is a cardboard uh, box, you know, from, from Band-Aids. Um, for a while, there seemed to be, you know, just like this, a lot of Band-Aid boxes accumulating and I was just collecting them and I filled them with plaster. Um, I built a plywood box around the cardboard box so that it would stay nice and straight mm. and then fill it with plaster on one side. And then once the plaster set, just peel off the box. So you have textures and remnants of the, the flaps where they overlap. And um, I think the Band-Aid slogan is like, heals the hurt or something. So uh -huh. um, okay. that's where the title came from. Okay. <laughs> and. Uh, but I put those all together on this little shelf. And then, but I also drilled a hole through all of the plaster forms after they were cast. And they're just on the end, you can see it, but there's a little piece of aluminum tubing yeah. that runs through all of them, kind of pierces all of them from one side to the other. And, and it kind of holds them together. Um, but it, I think it kind of also just refers to that sort of, that piercing of, of, the, of the box. And, uh, from different angles, you can see the pipe because the, the boxes are separated by a little bit of space. So you can see the, uh -huh. the tubing. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, this, so the, the previous piece and this piece are from a show I had uh, last, or I guess it was at the very end of 2019 and it kind of rolled into the beginning of 2020. And this was a, a two-person show also at Gallery Route One um, with Madeline Hope. Um, she and I shared a artist uh, membership. So when it was time for us to have a show, we, we had it together in the main space. And um, for that show, I was doing a lot of work where I was casting objects in concrete and plaster and cement. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the pieces in that show were more abstract, but at the end, I, I went back to the can the, the, the tin can seems to always be something that's hanging around the studio. So mm -hmm. it, they get used a lot for all kinds of things. And so and I, it's, a, I, and it's a form that you like. 
Yeah, there's just something kind of so, so simple, but it's so immediately recognizable. Yeah. And um, yeah, so I made a mold of one of the cans and then cast it a few times and yeah, started kind of doing these stacking things. But that was also sort of a little bit of a transitional moment because that was the last piece I made for that show. And, mm -hmm. and, and so it became more, you know, I was kind of returning to the object again after having been on a little bit of a hiatus from the object and I was making more abstract forms. So then at the same time, I started playing around with casting more objects again. And so I was doing light bulbs for a while. And so this is the piece that's one of the pieces that's in the members show. Mm -hmm. So how is this, this one, are, these are cast cement, is that right? Yeah. This one here yeah. And, the, and yeah. the light bulbs one is cast yeah. cement. I think the light bulb, the other one was plaster, uh, but it's, it's been painted. And then I mm -hmm. um, covered that, the previous one in, in like a silver, it's really glitter, but on the, on the can it says silver flake. Um, uh -huh. But it's got this kind of shiny iridescence to it when the light hits it. Um, that to me kind of looks like little, like pin pricks of light, yeah. almost like stars or something um, against the black ground of the bulbs. and. And the way that I cast the bulbs, you know, the wires integrated into the casting. So oh. they, um, I was using this material called derma gel for the casting, which is it's 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 really immediate. You just mix it with water and you and you put it around the object, and then it makes this really smooth mold mm -hmm. that you can, um, you know, it's it doesn't last very long. You can usually make like three or four castings from it before it starts to deteriorate. But wow. people use it a lot for casting body. Um, you know, if like you want to do a cast of your hand, it's a really good material uh -huh. to use. Um, and then, you know, I mean, going way back in time, uh, back to, you know, when I was in school, uh, I took a mold making class. And one of the things we got to play with was uh, something like Derma Gel, but it was available on the college campus through the dental school. So uh -huh. you'd go there and you'd get this little can of powder and it was very, this really great stuff. You just mix it with water and you put it on something and it, and it hardens pretty quick. So you can make these really expedient little molds. Uh -huh. And then- That's great. Yeah. Well, uh, Joe, I'm gonna start doing that. <laughs> yeah, it's fun. <laughs> so it's a lot of fun. I'm here to steal your ideas. <laughs> so I hope you don't mind. Deal away. Um, I had a, I wanted to ask you um, who we, well, first of all, what your art training is. You know, are you self taught? Did you go to art school? Yeah. Did you? Yeah. Um, I started out, well, originally I'm from Ohio and um, I mean, that's where I grew up. And I uh, started out, I did two years at the, the local art school after high school. Um, and I was on scholarship there. So my scholarship ran out after a couple of years. And I transferred to the Ohio State University. And so they had a really great, or you know, still have a really great art department there. And um, there's a contemporary art center that's attached to the university. So it was a little bit more radical in a way than the art school, which was, I always thought was kind of conservative. Mm -hmm. um, it was really rooted in the Bauhaus and that, that, that kind of teaching. Um, so it was that it was that they were like two different worlds. So when I transferred to Ohio State, um, I got really immersed in contemporary sculpture, and um, that, that's kind of my background. I got my BFA in sculpture uh -huh. uh, in 1999, yeah. and, and after that, moved to the West Coast uh -huh. after I graduated. <laughs> so, and what artists would you say most influenced you in your work? Um, well, I mean every. I feel like I've looked at so much art in my lifetime, whether mm -hmm. it's in person or in reproductions. And, but the things that always have the most uh, impact on me have been the things that I've seen, you know, in the flesh. And uh, especially when I was in school, we, you know, other art students and I, we'd travel around and go see shows. And um, being in Ohio, you're, you're really not that far from New York. Um, you can get to Chicago in about five hours. So, I do remember seeing this show at the, uh, it's, it's like the, the ICA, the Institute of Contemporary Art in Chicago, and it was Rachel uh, White Reed. Um, and it was 
you know, at the very beginning of her career and she makes a lot of castings and stuff. So that actually mm -hmm. was a real standout show because she was casting these hot water bottles and mattresses and things. And I had never seen anything like that before. Mm -hmm. um, you know, she'd cast a whole mattress and then lean it against the wall and it would just be kind of, you know, curving because it was just sort of a heavy object and it was made of rubber. So it would just kind of just be sitting there. And I don't know, that that was really influential. And um, there was an, uh, Eva Hess was also a really big influence mm -hmm. at the beginning, even though I haven't seen much of her work in person. I always there admired. A, there was a show of her work at the MoMA. Yeah, yeah, I did, I did get to see that, yeah. Um, yeah. But when I was younger, it was just all in books, but it made a real impression on me the way that she yeah. used forms and things to kind of like existed in between the world of abstraction and, and the world of, of objects, so. Mm -hmm. Are you fellas ready to move on to Will now? Sure. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> Time flies. Um, <laughs> thank you, Joe. I know. Yeah, thanks, Will. Um, let's see. So I've been, uh, my name is Will Toms. I've been a member of the gallery for 12 years now, I think. Um, it's a great community of artists and I'm really happy to be there been a little difficult lately because we can't get together too much, um, except this way. Um, and I've been, I've been drawing since I was a child and uh, when I could hold a crayon. Um, but I really, I don't have any formal art training. Uh, and I started painting when I was in my late twenties, really seriously. Um, and I think what drove it was the fact that I was working for a, I was working in a, a residential treatment center for young adults who were, um, had, had had a psychotic break. And it was an experimental program that was uh, started by two Jungian uh, psychiatrists and they hired 20 of us. Some had some experience as psych techs and, some like myself had no experience, but they just put, um, we had several clients in a house up on, uh, I think it was, where was it exactly? I can't remember now, but it was in San Francisco. And um, uh, it, it, it was an intense and powerful experience for me to work with people who had come unmoored from uh, the reality that we know. And, uh, People were treated without any kind of um, uh, drugs, uh, any antipsychotic drugs. So everyone was roaming around. And it was, I would do a 48 hour shift once a week there. It was really intense. Uh, very few pe people don't sleep much when they're in that state. And this was, these were young adults who had never had any psychiatric problems before, but had a sudden break for some reason. Uh, could it be a personal trauma? Sometimes there was an LSD trip that never ended or didn't end for a couple of weeks. Um, and what happened when I would go home and go to sleep is my dream life was incredibly intense. Um, and I was getting, I was reading a lot of Carl Jung. I was getting up <laughs> after every dream and, and quickly jotting down my impressions. And at that time, I started also to... Um, started painting. Um, this is, this painting here was done much later, but I was started painting and I was doing uh, paintings um, with oil pastels and then later with paintings with gouache. And basically I was illustrating my dreams. And eventually that moved into something, uh, I was doing more sculptural work, um, uh, working with scrap wood and chicken wire and aviary cloth and roplex medium and stuff that I would find on the street. And eventually had a show at uh, Southern Exposure Gallery in San Francisco on Alabama Street. And it was, I think it was in about, I'm gonna hold up this. This was, the, I just found this. This was the invitation to the show. And I had the dates on there, but I forgot to put the year. 
So it was in February, I think it was in 1977. And this really got me started. And it's, I think this experience uh, has driven my work for ever since, really. Um, uh, you know, I started doing, uh, there, was a, there was a hiatus where I didn't, after that show, I didn't do much for a while. I was really busy. Paula, my wife and I have five children. I was working full time. She was working full time. And, uh, but eventually as the kids got older, I started working again and um, eventually uh, joined Gallery Route One. It's been a great experience for me having an art community. Um, when did you join the gallery? Probably 2008. Oh, okay. I yeah, I think, I think the first thing I did was, a, was I was in a member show right away. And then there was a box show, which is I've done every year since. They're, those are really fun yeah to do so anyway um, yeah one thing i was wondering about your paintings because as long as i've as long as i've been seeing them they always um you know feel really you know constructed you know out, out of different elements um, but they always manage to retain this kind of flatness like a traditional painting and i was just wondering if you could speak a little bit about your process and how you you know, organize the picture and the, you know, sometimes things on the surface are painted and sometimes they're applied like a collage. Um, yeah. But those two things, sometimes something that looks like a collage is actually painted and vice versa. So yeah. it seems like that's something you play around with a lot. Um, all of these paintings that you'll see actually, of these larger ones, um, started off as grids. You can actually see the grid. Um, there was always a row of, of, of dots across, which get, eventually gets obscured. I, I always thought of that as, heart, as a heartbeat. Mm. Um, and yeah, they're painted. They're painted. They take me forever, these paintings, because I think um, when I started working a little bit larger, that was maybe three or four years ago, uh, I asked a friend of mine who's a painter that I, whose work I really admire, I said, his name is Lucho Pozo. And I said, um, Lucho, how do I, do you have any advice for me when I'm gonna start working larger? And he said, just buy bigger brushes. <laughs> so I think what he meant by that was, it's not with the hand anymore, it's with the whole gesture. Right, right. Uh, but to me, it doesn't, it doesn't really work for me. So I, I'm very detail oriented. So this is another one in that same series. And it's a series that I've been working on now for three or four years. Um, they go very slowly because uh, it, I'm never satisfied. So I'll, I'll work on something for a while, come into the studio someday and I look at it and I guess this is terrible. And I put it away for a while and then take it out and work on it again. It looks, it'll look different or have a better, better look at it. Mm. Uh, and I wanted to show these, and the last time I did a show at the gallery was in 2018, and I wanted to show these, and I was going to try to do 10 big paintings, but they're just time consuming, and I didn't have time. Show was coming up, so I decided what I was going to do is collect cardboard from all over the place, because I've been very interested in working with cardboard, uh, and so I did 20 or 25 pieces in about three or four months using um, boxes. Basically, you can see on this one, um, and I would title them basically the printing from the box. And this one is 3A3B75. Mm -hmm. um, so I would flatten out the cardboard, seal it front and back with um, shellac uh, to just to prime, to prime and make the surface stronger. And then I put a, you can, you can see it in, in this one, a little wooden armature behind it, pine, just a very simple pine armature to make it, keep it flat. Um, so I did several, you know, I did a whole bunch of these and some of them are gonna come up next. This one has a, they're, they're all fairly small. The one before I had a toilet plunger in it. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> and yeah. yeah, that one, that's a little toilet plunger in there. Or it's one of the, it's the flap Oh, okay. It's yeah, in the I know tank it. of the toilet. Yeah. So when you flush the toilet, it lifts up and lets the water down in. Oh. 
How do you, so how this do you is a very small, this is very small. You can see because the, the printing is basically indicates the scale of it. Yeah. Well, I have noticed that you have a lot of little objects and things in your paintings from time to time. And I, you know, I imagine you just collect these things over the I years, do. maybe. Yeah. You have a, you know, that one's a, that's thing. another cardboard piece, a little bit bigger. And it's covered with, uh, it, you know, it's, it's, it's card, it's, cardboard with a cardboard applied to it. And then there's various building materials, which I have a lot of. Mm -hmm. uh, those, the, the black squares are asphalt saturated paper. <laughs> that oh, yeah. in building. And then I sprayed just these, you know, th they look like letters, but they're not letters. And so that's basically what that is. It's a collection of this stuff. I use a lot of building materials because that's what I did for 40 years. Yeah, so I guess that, you know, one of my questions had to do with how being a contractor would have influenced your work and obviously the, the choice of materials, um, but are there other ways that, you know, being a contractor, um, you know, might have affected how you say put your painting together or just, you know, just when I think of your paintings as constructions, then I, then I see that relationship between yeah. you know being a builder and being a painter <laughs> yeah i think the building you know that doing i love working with my hands and this was a it was a perfect occupation i tried many things i drove a cab and did a lot of other things but when i started uh, I, working with my brother in cape cod building houses i thought this is it this is just so much fun yeah and i've done that and i, I really enjoy it and i think it informs my artwork no, and this is the one that's in this one here. Um, it's called One Door Closes and Another Opens. And this is the one that's in the gallery now. It's four feet by four feet. Mm. Uh, again, this went through many changes to get here. And I remember when I talked about it in the, the video that we did for the Resilience show, I said it's like plate spinning. Yeah. I watched I that. On, on Ed Sullivan, when I was a kid, I'd watch them, the, the performers. Um, spinning plates on poles, try to get them going, all going at the same time. Uh, sometimes yeah. that didn't work, but, but then eventually it would, it would work. So that's kind of what this reminds me of. And working on it and working on it over and over and trying lots of different things, that's a detail from it. And uh, finally, it, got, so it, yeah, I like it, it seems to work as a piece, but the eye travels all around. It's hard to fix on it. So that's the trick, yeah. is to try to get it to work, to try to get the details to work and then to try to get it to work as a whole. That's a that's a shot that I did when it was in progress and I'm working on it flat, as you can tell. And there's clamps in the back that are holding pieces of plywood in and they glued them with yellow glue. Yeah, I was wondering about how, you know, the way the surface is always really activated and, um, you know, keeps your eye moving. Um, the way that the, pieces are applied and and kind of just the general perspective always seems to me, you know, as if you're looking at some, you know, a, an aerial perspective on something. And so I, that was one of my other questions was, you know, what, do you work on the wall or do you work on a table? And I could see it from that picture that you're working on a table, but um, maybe you go back and forth and have the piece hanging when you're applying the paint. Yeah, I do. I go back and forth because you can't see it when it's on the table. so. And sometimes yeah, I work on it when it's, you know, on the wall as well. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, do you, are you influenced by that idea of landscape? And cause I do see a lot of landscape in your uh, paintings just only, but only that maybe that's just what I'm bringing to it. But, but that, that idea that you'd be in an airplane looking down at the earth and you'd see, you know, that kind of quilt pattern of, of the land. And, and I see that, you know, in your paintings as well but I don't know if that's conscious or not. Well, I love maps and, and yeah. probably they have a horrible sense of direction. So I really- <laughs> I That would explain why it's- They're just dense with detail. And I use a yeah. lot of, um, as a builder, I had a lot of uh, plan, you know, big rolls of plans, uh, which were left over from the building projects. And uh, I used, I put those out on the floor and stained them with either spray paint or acrylic. And that the, all that becomes the raw material. So the information is still on the plan, but it's kind of obscured. 
Yeah. Oh. Anyway, that's, yeah. Well, when you make the grid as kind of the, it's that the grid sort of the ground, I guess, of your, like yeah. the, the, the structure, but do you, do you vary that grid all, you know, for different works or do you, you know, keep it consistent so that you're always starting with, you know, similar size squares or rectangles or. No, I same. I mean, it's always a grid. Yeah, it, it's, but, it's always it, a grid, but it's that varies. Sometimes it's three by three, four by four, five by five. Yeah. And I like a square because it's a kind of a neutral mm -hmm. shape. You know, if it's a, if it's wider than it is high, it, it, it suggests landscape. Yes. Yeah. The other yeah. way around, it suggests a portrait or a figure yeah. or a heroic. Thing, yeah. but so I want it to be neutral. <laughs> yeah. So I, I really like that shape, and I'm gonna yeah. keep. Yeah. I mean, that. sometimes the actual piece is a square too, right? Um, you know, like the finished the finished outside perimeter of the canvas. Or do you use canvas, or is it just all panel? No, it's all. Um, I use uh, door skin. You know, um, eighth inch oh, yeah. birch plywood, mm -hmm. and then I make the frames. Okay. Um, out of you know this pine one by two pine. Or yeah. one by one time. Yeah. I, I is but the a one... good surface because it's it's resilient. It can take a lot of punishment because I sand. Yeah. It. Right. Right. <laughs> um, but the piece in the members show is. Are you a, guys the ready for letting the audience join in? Uh, I guess so. Sure. <laughs> sure. <laughs> 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 okay. Great. All right, so that means um, at this time, if you, if any of you have questions, uh, just raise your hand like this, and then when you get called on, you can unmute and ask your question. Um, yeah, and I do know that we have Jen in the chat. Um, Gabriella wanted to know, Joe, if your little bed sculpture was made out of a library file drawer. Uh, you know, it looks like that. I'm not really sure. I think it came from an old desk, um, but yeah, it, I'm not exactly sure of its origin and I don't even remember how I acquired it, um, but it does resemble the, the scale. It's definitely like a card sized uh, file drawer from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but I did have a, just as a little backstory, I did spend a number of years working in a library. And so that's kind of before I got into doing the work I do now. Um, as a student, I worked in the fine arts library. So um, maybe in some weird way, I don't know, that piece that the, the drawer came into my life because I worked in a library and maybe, I don't know. <laughs> All right, the key stuff. I really related to that piece and I liked it. I thought maybe you slept in a library or something. While you were <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, yeah, I really think it's great. And I yeah. thought it was a lovely um, drawer too. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Emily, Emily Tom Dipper. Hey, um, I have a question for both of you about um, how it seems like there's a lot of found objects in both of your art. Um, how much does that influence the work that you do, things that you actually find? Does that make you start a piece? And also, um, I was just wondering about you know, um, how artists go through different phases in their lives and your art changes. Um, what has caused your art to change over the years? Is it a, a break, a change, or a, a break from doing art for a while and then starting in on something different? Or what has been the inspiration? Uh, well, I, I just quickly answer by saying that the, the object for me is, is kind of everything um, because things come into my studio from the world outside and and they sit around and I look at them long enough and I just get ideas from them being in my life and develop uh, some method to utilize that object in a way to make a sculpture. Um, so, so really like that, you know, if it weren't for the objects, I don't know how much art I would be making um, because I don't think I would just necessarily be super inventive. It's the object that kind of is the catalyst for 
the piece. So, um, and I would say that I would say the same thing myself. It's um, my work is really material driven. I think in in a lot of ways. Um, the cardboard pieces, for example, it's because I love the material and it's so plentiful. So, um, and the, it's, it's quite beautiful in its own way. So, and it's really driven by that. And I think that's how you and I relate, Joe, in our work, even though it looks very different, is that it's, for both of us, it's pretty strongly material driven. Yeah, I totally agree. And what was the second part of your question? Um, Emily? Oh, just um, different phases. I mean, I've seen different phases in my dad's work. Um, Will is my dad. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so I was wondering, I mean, you had a lot of plaster casts and I was wondering what other phases you've gone through as an artist, if any, yeah. or has it been plaster and has it always been sculpture? Uh, yeah, I mean, I've moved through a lot of different stuff over the years. Um, I started out wanting to be in the ceramics department um, because I loved clay. Um, but there were a lot of technical things that are involved in learning and about clay and, and, and it got, I just felt like I was going to get bogged down and, and having to understand glazes and firing and all this stuff. And it wasn't, it wasn't as, it didn't feel as free to me. Um, so I moved into the world of sculpture, but I also always wanted to be a painter, uh, but I really poor color sensibility is really poor. So I just use the colors of the materials and, um, and, and I also just like, you know, building things. So I, sculpture just actually is probably the most appropriate thing for me to be doing. Um, but I've also moved through a lot of phases just in terms of the forms. And, um, you know, although the object is always the catalyst for making the work, um, I'd say, you know, there are times when the object is just uh, inspires me because of its shape to make something that's more abstract. So I've, I've made stuff that has to do with lines and um, trying to make three-dimensional lines. Um, and so those are just more like lines in space. And, um, and so they're not really like objects anymore. They're, they're, it's like taking something off of a piece of paper and making it three-dimensional. Um, so that, that's a way that I, you know, and I kind of go through these little cycles. Right now I'm in a, like, a, a, like a real object-oriented way of working, but probably in a few years, I'll, you know, sort of gradually go back to doing something I did many years ago. And, and I, I seem to kind of move that way, spend some time doing work, one way of working and then move into a, another way of working, so. And, and for me, I would say, you know, I started off um, drawing, you know, wanting to make pictures, like when I was doing the, you know, illustrating my dreams, for example. And eventually moved in, and I and like Joe, I'm I have um, a background in building, and so I'm really interested in making paintings that are that are like sculptures in a way. And I think of them not so much as windows to the world as as objects in themselves. Um, and that's yeah. kind of my direction, and that's what makes me that's what gives me a lot of pleasure in my art making, art practice. Yeah. yeah. I think Kisa, Kisa, Kisa with her hand up. I actually talked once, but I just find it really interesting that your background, how it affects your whole life. And I, I really think that's uh, interesting to the, uh, what happens in your art. I mean, it's really, it is hard to separate it because we had talked about that when we did our little talk yeah. <laughs> going off about our lives. But I do think I see how it affects you. And I thought the interesting thing about the two of you, even though there's a real connection and I think it was a really great, it is a great pairing. Uh, Will is so color oriented and Joe is so, you know, very simple and lack of color, I would say. I, I, yeah. I always thought that about your pieces, it's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I would, I would love to bring color into my work more, like really vibrant color, but I just don't have uh, the skills for that, so. <laughs> um, Tori Dobrin had a question, and then Sandy will be next. Hi, I think I'm on, on mute now. Will, I was wondering which artists in the past or even the present have inspired you the most? Oh, there's so many. <laughs> um, the one I think I would point to um, would be uh, 
Rauschenberg, Robert Rauschenberg, who's uh, been dead now for about 10 years. Um, but I've seen a lot of his work. And there was one painting in the, in the Museum of Modern Art's permanent collection that I used to go, when I lived in San Francisco, I'd go look at it all the time. And I, it's this great big thing. And he used all kinds of materials, uh, pieces of wood, newspapers, photographs, uh, commercial paint, oil paint. And I would look at that thing and I'd think, this, it was so freeing. Yeah. Uh, it was so freeing to see that. And I thought, wow, you can do that? That's great. And it just has really inspired me. And I've seen uh, other painters and other artwork, I'd say, um, probably most recently, a couple of years ago, was a show at the Museum of Modern Art here in, in San Francisco of um, uh, Mark Bradford, um, huge paintings. Um, he's an LA based artist. Uh, he's probably around 60 some years old and uh, was recently, well, anyway, he's, he does these, he paints on canvas, but it's basically built up paintings um, using stuff that he collected and put down and glued down and over string and he'd pull the string up and then sand them and, re, and in sanding them, he'd um, reveal the, the layers that were underneath. They ended up, um, I don't know how he does it. They're just an ama they're amazing paintings. And so I, I, if any chance I get, I'm gonna go and look at his work. So that's just two, but there's many more. Elizabeth Murray, um, the, the, the quilts of the, of G's Ben quilt makers, um, so many things. But mostly I'm interested in abstract art, I guess I have to say. All right, I think it, we're getting to uh, the point where we should start wrapping things up. And um, I know Sandy has a question. So let's hear Sandy's question next. It's a quickie. I just wondered how the isolation of this uh, COVID thing has affected uh, both of you in the making of art and in the art you created. Um, yeah, well, interesting. I mean, for me, I, I in a lot of ways, my life has kind of just gone on the way that it always has, um, because I, I I work in a wood shop and and I work by myself, um, and my studio is uh, connected to the wood shop. So, so um, you know, in a weird way, it hasn't really affected my ability to do anything, um, but it has inspired my the just the direction that my work is going a little bit and it's it's becoming a little bit more liberated from some of the processes that I was more involved in and I'm kind of looking more at the object as almost like a ready-made type of object um, and so I think you know the next group of work that, I, that I'll be showing is going to probably have less casting and less manipulation and just be more about the the found object itself and, and even just presenting those things as they are. So what about you, Will? Uh, actually, I don't think that it has affected me too much because I'm kind of reclusive anyway. But I, I have noticed that um, how much actually I need um, other people around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and that, that actually um, helps me with my work. You know, so it's actually, I haven't done much during this time. I haven't done much artwork during this time, kind of. I thought, well, this is a time to get busy, but it hasn't really worked out that way. So I'm looking forward to the end of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I do, I do miss the social part of being able to meet in the gallery or, you know, we could be having this artist conversation in the gallery um, right. at a different time. So I look forward to when we're able to do that again. Except we've developed new skills, so that's good. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> this is true. Any, uh, okay, Tori Dorbrin. Sorry to ask once again. Uh, when you both walk into a, a museum, do you go to other areas that you specifically are interested in or that uh, influence you in some way other than contemporary art? 
Um, wow. Yeah, I mean, I love looking at other art from other cultures, um, you know, especially at the De Young, there's a lot of uh, great stuff that, um, you know, there's a, there's a section in the De Young um, that is, um, you know, I think, I don't know what the right term for, it. I wanna say Eskimo art, but I know that it has another name. Um, it's broader than that. And, but where they're making uh, utilitarian things from, you know, just the animals that are available. And there, there's like beautiful parkas that are made from seal, seal skin and stuff. And so, I mean, that's just one example, but I love looking at, at art from other cultures. Um, and and I, although I love contemporary art, I, I do love, just anything that's made by hand and crafted with, you know, attention to detail. So. Uh, I'd say the same thing. You know, the, the, one of the most exciting shows I saw was uh, Paula, my wife and I were in Paris. I think it's called the Branley Museum and it's all so-called primitive art. Um, that was the most exciting show, just to see stuff that was had been done so many years ago and how it relates to what's going on right now. So, mm. And otherwise, um, I'm most interested in contemporary, you know, 20th century art, I think. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much, Will and Joe. That was fantastic. And thank you, everyone, for coming and joining us today. We hope you'll join us um, at the gallery to see the members exhibition, Resilience. It's up through uh, January 17th, and you can visit the gallery Thursday through Sunday, 11 to 5. Um, you can also view the works on our website site if you don't want to make it to the gallery um, and you can purchase works at growshop.org. Uh, the next exhibition to open in our gallery is the annual juried exhibition. The juror Donna, is Donna Seeger of the Seeger Gray Val, uh, Gallery in Mill Valley and the exhibition is called Crossing the Divide and that show opens on the 23rd with a virtual opening on the 24th. If you were moved by today's presentation and want to support the work that Gallery Route One does in to bring art to the community, then please visit our website and make a donation today. Make a note in the comments that your donation is because of artist conversations. And thanks again for coming. And we hope to see you at our next artist conversations. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Shelly. <laughs> Thanks, Will. Thanks a lot, Joe. And thank you, Shelly, for hosting this. Yeah, appreciate it. Take care, everyone. Yeah, you're welcome. <laughs>